This is part three of a three-part interview with Norman Bodak, the godfather of Lean. In part two, Norman discussed Shingo Ono, on-error training, and the power of quality. In this session, we'll hear about Beyond the Seven Wastes, Poka Yoke, Job Enrichment, and Siwa Yuku. I was, had a couple follow-ups about Ono and Shingo. One of the first things I did as an industrial engineer in my career was put in a supermarket for just in time. So it was interesting to hear you say that. So I didn't realize Ono was kind of the, the founder of that. So who on that theme, we still teach things like the seven wastes. In your opinion, who who kind of created those seven wastes? And Ono, to me, created the seven wastes because Ono identified one, which is what we should all do, but very few people do this. Ono identified what are the strategic problems standing in front of him from obtaining his success. And so Ono recognized in order to be successful, he wanted to get what he called just in time. We only make one car at a time. So why are we gearing up to, for a thousand cars when we only make one at a time? Let's focus on what, it, what do we need to make that one car at a time? And he called it just in time or the Toyota production system. In order to attain his strategic goal of just in time, he identified what stands in the way. What stands in the way of attaining his goal of just in time? Now, what we need is the key thing is we have to develop our vision. Most companies in America don't even have a vision. Then we have to establish a mission, how to attain that vision. Then you have to look at the obstacles standing in the way of attaining that mission and vision. This is what Ono did. And, and standing in the way of just in time were these ways. Inventory was much too large. And Shingo, when he looked at that punch press, he, Ono said, I want you to go from four hours to two hours. And Shingo said, okay. Then Ono comes back a day later and he said, that's not good enough, Shingo. You have to get it down to 10 minutes. And Shingo said, okay, imagine, okay, I'm going to work with you and watch this machine process and see how do we get it down to 10 minutes. And Shingo was such a genius that he did it. He did. He came up with something really brilliant, Chris. He said, the machine is running and then it stops. And we do a lot of things when the machine stops. As an example, in plastics, it could take about one hour just to heat the dye. And Shingo said, why can't we take things when the machine stops? Why can't we do it when it's running? This is a brilliant discovery. He called this inside exchange of dye and outside exchange of dye. Outside meant what can we do while the machine was running to be ready for the changeover? So he would take a die as an example, and he would heat it up externally. And then when the machine stopped, the die was already hot. He just moved it into the machine, took the old one out. Now, the old one even had a problem because they used to turn about 30 bolts in order to bolt it down. And then what came to Shingo, look at a tape recorder. The old tape recorder, you would take a little disc and you would put it in and just one lever would lock, the, would lock this tape recorder. He says, why can't I do this with a die? Why can't, instead of having these 30, 40 bolts, why can't I just take a lever and lock it in? Boom, and that's done. And so Shingo figured out how to go from inside to outside exchange of die. And he came up with so many things that we can do to prepare for the changeover that when the changeover came, we can do it literally in seconds. And that's what they did. It took 40 hours for General Motors to take a changeover. And I saw it Toyota done in seven minutes. 40 hours to seven minutes. It's amazing what you can do. I mentioned the seven wastes, and I, and I think now Apex has even expanded it, Norman, into eight wastes, which, which includes, I think, the safety component or this people skills, right? waste of people skills. And then I was listening to one of your presentations recently. I don't know if it was with Mark Graven or something that you did at Portland for their chapter up there, but you introduced a ninth waste. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it, uh, it's wonderful what came, comes to me, this divine energy that takes good, so such good care of me. And I did come up with the seventh waste. Well, the reason is because 
I focused, when I sold my company Productivity in 1999, I couldn't compete with them, so I had to take something new. So what I took was the Japanese suggestion system, which is so powerful. In America, we had an American suggestion system. The first suggestion goes back to 1898 with Kodak, and the first suggestion was clean the windows. Good idea, but they wouldn't let the worker do it. The supervisor had to do it. Well, the supervisor said, this is baloney. I don't want the worker to give me ideas to give me more work. So we killed the suggestion system in America. Well, Toyota and other Japanese company copied us. They picked it up. And Toyota, believe it or not, one 1980, they were getting 70 improvement ideas per year per worker. In America, our suggestion system became a cost-saving system, and we were getting one idea every seven years from the average work. One idea every seven years, and Toyota was getting 70 per year. Very small, little ideas that the worker could implement on their own. That's a very important that's a very powerful process. So I started to teach it. I wrote three books on the subject on how do you get small little ideas from people and help them implement it on their own and how meaningful to this for their company. You mentioned Paul Akers earlier. Paul Akers took that concept and he called it two second lean. Paul is a master of simplicity. <laughs> it's really the opposite of my teaching, but he's been very successful. He is an amazing man. He built his own house. He can fix his own car. He can fly an airplane. He has done so many complex things, but he, but he breaks it down and he makes it very simple. And so he teaches simplicity to people. I don't. My teacher, Rudy, said, if there's a harder way to do it, show it to me because it must be wonderful and I want to do it. Because Rudy recognized when something's hard, you learn. When something's simple, you don't learn. So we should not resist difficulty. When you want to ride a bicycle, it's very difficult. But when you get on it, boy, it becomes so easy. That suggestion system that you are getting input from the, the employees, that was number eight? That, was, that became the eighth waste, the underutilization of people's talents. Invest in people. And the best way to invest in people is have them do it. Challenge them to grow. Let them do it. And a supervisor's role is to develop people, not to control people. And the newest one that I learned recently was, um, you can expand on that one, you call it the ninth waste, management resistance to change. Yes. The reason for this is everybody resists change. It's part of human nature. We're all afraid to make a mistake, you know. This whole idea, we're all afraid to make a mistake. I mean, afraid to make a mistake. You go to school, right? And what happens when you make a mistake? Yeah, you get reprimanded or poor grades or... Of course, of course. It's so, our, 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 our educational system is so messed up. Our society reflects our educational system. How can you go through 13 years of school, graduate high school, and, and you don't have a skill? You can go work in McDonald's or Walmart, but you don't have a skill. That's a crime. Our schools should be focused on giving you skills. Education should be reversed. Every time you make a mistake, it's an opportunity to learn. Well, in the ninth grade, I have such a poor memory of sitting in history class, and Gary looks at me, a friend. He says, Gary, why are you so sad, Norman? And I said, Gary, because I go home every night, I do my homework, I come in the next day, I take the test, and I just don't remember. I don't remember what I read. And Gary says, Norman, same thing happened to me, but I came, I got a solution. I said, what is it, Gary? He says, I go home and do the assignment, and I put onto a little sheet of paper all of the ideas that I read. I said, Gary, that's brilliant. So I went home that night, took a little small sheet of paper, and I wrote down all of the key things as I'm reading. I put it into my shirt pocket. I come and take the test the next day, and I said, wow, I know the answer, but I can't remember. I look at the little sheet of paper, and there's the teacher standing over me. She grabbed the sheet of paper, and what do you think she said, Chris? Why are you cheating? That's right. Now, the irony is I felt so guilty for so many years by being a cheater. All the teachers, she told every teacher in school, Norman is a cheater. That was such a terrible year in the ninth grade. But who did they cheat? They cheated Norman by not giving me the right education. They cheated me. I didn't cheat them. 
Who do I hurt? What's the difference of having the information on a sheet of paper or having it in my head? What's the difference? Today with internet, why do you need a memory? Just learn. You have to know how to access it to use it. You don't need a memory anymore. Why do they continue to punish children with these tests, testing their memory? No. Can I apply knowledge? That's the key to education. Can I apply it? Can I use it? Can I serve other people with it? I should go to school. They should learn. They should teach me cooking. They should teach me carpentry. I'm watching. There's a new house being built right near me. It is beautiful going up. I'm watching these carpenters. They are geniuses. It's amazing their skill putting the lumber together and making this wonderful house. Schools should give you knowledge to apply, not fill your head with junk that you can't use. You can only use what you apply. Now back to that, the waste. I'm verifying that oh, you, you say Ono was kind of the creator of the seven wastes. Oh, yeah, back to the managers. Yeah, now, now we take the ninth waste, which is managers' resistance to change. Because everybody was li- living in fear. Managers don't want to make a mistake because that's our culture. We get clobbered by making mistakes. And so they're afraid of making mistakes. And so they have all this resistance to change. Because if they do the same thing today that they did yesterday, they survived yesterday, all right, they'll, they'll survive today. Change can bring problems. Change can bring mistakes. Well, yeah, once in a billion years, you can blow up a building. That's a terrible mistake. But most of these millions of mistakes that we make are wonderful opportunities for learn. And Shingo came up with something so wonderful, and he called it pokayoke. Pokayoke. In America, we had something called mis- mis- mistake proofing. And in Japan, they had a, a, a word called baktayoke. And baktayoke means foolproofing. That's what we called it, foolproofing. And Shingo is talking about bhakti, okay? And a woman worker starts to cry. And he says, why are you crying? And she says, because I'm not a fool. You're calling this bhakti, okay? I'm not a fool. I made a mistake, yes, but I'm not a fool. And Shingo realized at that moment, and he changed it. We didn't do this in America. But Shingo changed it, and he called it poka, okay? Poka means misproofing. And then Shingo said, every time you make a mistake, you should try to come up with an idea to prevent that mistake to never happen again. And that's what he did. I would go to a a plant in Japan. I've never seen it in America, but I'd go to a plant and I'd see a thousand pokeyoke devices. So if I'm using a drill, the computer is connected to that drill to tell it how much torque should be in that drill. You don't leave it to the worker. Every time there's a mistake, you try to come up with something so the mistake could never be done again. And these sensors, they cost dollars. You know what I mean? They're so cheap to use a sensor. And people should be taught pokey okay. Every time there's a mistake, come up with something. You can't do it again. Managers resist change. That's the ninth waste. How do we get managers to really lead and promote change and not be afraid of making mistakes, but pay people for mistakes? That's why this book I wrote, I published, The Happiest Company to Work For. It has a hundred ideas there how to be happy. This company is amazing. These people at at Mirai Denki, they came up with more patents than probably Sony. This company has a thousand people. Maybe Sony has a hundred thousand people. And they've come up with as many patents as Sony. They are they they pay people more than anywhere else in the industry. The people get more more holidays, more more paid sick sick leave. Every five years, the whole company shuts down for one week and all thousand people go somewhere in the world. The year I was there, everybody went to Italy. It's an amazing company to work for. He has one thing I love, which is called no ho ren so. No ho ren so. No ho. You can't, he says, when you wanna make a new decision, you don't ask anybody else. No discussion. No, no discussion. No, no, no consulting. That's what horenso means. Actually, it means spinach in Japanese. But ho and, and no ho, no renso, that means no discussion, no consulting, etc. We want people to be self reliant. That's the essence of what I teach in the Harada method. We want people to make decisions. We always go to the supervisors 
and and get their permission. That's crazy. You're a you're, you're a human being. You're intelligent. Why do you have to go and ask permission? We think that this is a good process to stop people making mistakes, but no, they still make mistakes. We want to really empower people, Chris. And the way you empower people is you demand them that they stand on their own two feet. Don't ask me what to do. Supervisors and managers become very smart when people go to them. We want those people to be smart. But no, our system is the opposite. It's a shame that when we call companies, especially these big companies, and you talk to people at the lowest level, they have so little power to get anything done. It's almost impossible to call a president of any large company. I've been trying this last year. I can't get through. I got one senior vice president from L.L. Bean. He's my student now on the Harada Harada Method. They've closed. The senior people are afraid to talk to their customers. They're making too much money. If you're lucky to get through to a phone number of a large corporation, you'll get a guardian. You'll get some man whose job or some woman's job is to prevent you to speak to them. It's a funny system. Well, hopefully this is going to change with this new thing from the 181 corporations because they're saying we're going to improve our customer service. If you're going to improve customer service, then you better start speaking to us. Cow Soap, which is the largest soap company in Japan, it's an amazing corporation, thousands of products. It initially competed with Procter & Gamble. Now it's better than Procter & Gamble. And they get 200 phone calls a year from their customers. And they relish it. They relish it because that's where we're getting all of our new products from. These people are complaining about something, then we should be improving it. We shut off that in America. We don't want the complaints. It's funny. We don't want complaints. But complaints is the way we grow. Yeah, we're we're all we're all so mixed up. So I'm hopeful this 181 is going to change all of that. It's very helpful for me. I I just realized on the what do you call it poke poke yoke. I've been mispronouncing it for 25 years. So I, that's one <laughs> that's lesson for me right there. And it's a great concept. I had two more follow ups on the lean, just the lean history there. One is the five S. Was that has that been around for a long time? And kind of where did that originate? Well. I like this. A couple of people call me the godfather of lean. And the reason they call me the godfather of lean, because not that I did anything. All I did was find the people who created it. So I found Ono and Shingo. They're the creators of of the Toyota production system. And then I found, miraculously, I don't speak Japanese. My wife is Japanese. But I don't speak Japanese. I can't read Japanese. But I have published 100 Japanese books in English. I'm like a magnet, Chris. I go to Japan and I sit with somebody that I like and I say to that person, what do you read? What do you like? And they would tell me. And then it was, gamb- it, yes, it was a big gamble. It's $25,000 is my gamble to publish a book. 30000 or even more. Shingo's book cost me $100,000 to publish his white book, which is a single minute exchange book. The white book is great. Big, tremendous gamble. I had no idea what I was doing, but I sold 100,000 copies at $60 a book. That's six million in sales. It was worth the 100,000 investment. Well, I found the man. I don't know exactly who created 5S. It was given to me by two people. One is Ryuji Fukuda gave it to me when I was publishing his work. And it was also given to me by Hirano. And I would, I would attribute, not that Hirano invented this, but he was the one that popularized it. He's the one that wrote about it. He wrote a book called JIT Implementation Manual, and I published it. I put it in two giant volumes. Believe it or not, I sold it for $3,000 for those two volumes, and I sold them like hotcakes. Nobody ever complained about those books. And in that book, we talk about 5S. And Hirano became a master teaching 5S. He became the master in the world. And he published, and I published a number, not one, but a number of books that he gave me on 5S and how to do it. It's simple, but powerful. One of my students, um, Gwen Galsworth, picked it up. For the last 30 years, she's been writing one book after the next, and she just teaches this all over the world, 5S. 
visual management, she calls it. And it's so simple and it's so powerful to focus on how do you make things that people can do things easier, they're not gonna make mistakes. Put it visually. So even in this idea system that I teach, I used to make everybody take a picture of the problem, and then when they came up with the solution, take another picture. And I taught this for a number of years, maybe 10 years. I made a nice living out of it. And one of my clients was here in, uh, in Oregon, and uh, I had uh, maybe it was 150 people, and we were coming up with, believe it or not, three implemented ideas per worker per week. That's 150 ideas that these people came up with and implemented them. And of course they were very small. And we would take all the pictures, Chris, and put it up on the wall. So everybody would see what we did, why? We wanted them to replicate it. We wanted them to copy. In America, we call copying wrong, just like Norman in school. Copying is wrong. Japanese recognize copying is great because you're going to learn from it. You copy somebody else, you'll learn from it, and then you improve it. So copying is wonderful. It is wonderful. Here was the dumbest kid in school, and I end up teaching at Portland State University at the School of Business. It's an amazing story. Well, I had students copying. I didn't handle it very well. One student, I asked to do a book review, and he went to a friend of his who took the course the previous year, he took the paper and he submitted the exact same paper to me, filled with all the same mistakes. He didn't have enough sense even to correct, correct the mistakes. And when he showed me the paper, I remembered the paper and I had, it, I had the student's paper in my desk and I looked at it and I saw the exact same paper that he copied. And I've been training that copying is wrong. So the student, when I got the student, I didn't throw him out of school. He could have gotten thrown out of school foolishly. I just said, go back and read the book and submit another paper on your own. That's all. I didn't punish him at all for that, but I made him redo it so that it, it was his own. But copying, if you're learning, the thing is, can you apply? That's the trick. If you copy and you can't apply, then it's wrong. But if you copy somebody else, and when you read a book at home, you're copying somebody else, aren't you? The whole idea of learning is copying from somebody else. And yet we say copying is wrong. That's crazy in American education. We want people to learn from each other. And the big criteria is not to pass the stupid test that people, teachers give you. And I call it a stupid test. The key is, can you apply that knowledge? And so we have to turn around education and figure out in education, uh, can people apply knowledge? That's it. Can they apply knowledge? If we're teaching something, can they blow, blow glass? Can they make glass? Can they, can they you know, make teacups? Can they do cooking? Or, or what's necessary to make a life for yourself? Norman, as I'm, it hasn't made its way into the Apex lexicon yet, but there's a sixth S, which I see a lot of companies and a lot of articles talking about is the safety side. So anyone that's listening may hear of, of success, but the, the true original is the five. My next just general topic on lean is, and it's probably a bigger discussion than we have time for today, but what, from a Toyota production system, I think in your book, you mentioned there's 33 tools. Is, is there kind of, is there, is that the list that you always reference as being like what you have to do to be lean or is there like less than that five or six or what's the number one or anything like that you can touch upon? What I did and others did too, because from my book and I published a hundred Japanese books and many of the English books also amplified this. Um, we identified about 33 tools. This is what I taught at college. And Ono never had any tools. So this is funny. He didn't use any tools. Ono just focused on eliminating the waste and becoming successful and getting to just in time in one way. And how do you get to just in time? I like what Toyota is doing now, by the way, which I don't see in America yet, is mastery. I teach this in the Harada Method. I want everybody to be a master. And I recommend anybody listening out there, learn this Harada Method. I mean, you could buy my book. You can go to Kindle. I think it's about $9. And, and you'll get the essence of the Harada Method. And if you have any money, call me and I'll teach you the Harada Method. And I'll teach you how to teach it so you'll make money by becoming a certified teacher. 
because the Rana method teaches you how to become the best that you are. You become a skilled person. You become a master. Toyota has a mastery system today. And Toyota identifies, the Japanese identify this throughout the country, as we said, the cleaning lady. They have what's called a, uh, they treasure masters. They, they have about 50 different disciplines, sword making and, and uh, all different kinds of crafts. And the best person is called the living master. They identify about 50 living masters. If you're a living master, I saw a plate. I really love this new plate, ceramic plate. I love the plate. It had, you know, drawings on the plate. And they were selling it for $2,000. Why? Because this man was a living master. People will buy from the living master, no matter what your value is. And so Toyota now is starting mastery. And they identify all of the, all of the main skills in the plant. And then they said, who in the plant is the best at this skills? Who is the best at this skill? And they become a master. And then they, they tell everybody in the company, you follow that man or that woman so that you become a master. Now, back in the 1800s, Chris, people were craftspeople or farmers. They were very high skilled people in order to live. And then along comes Frederick Taylor, father of industrial engineering, and Henry Ford, and they simplify work. Ford took Taylor's idea, he set up the assembly line, and instead of the person making a car the way they were doing earlier, they used to make cars in teams. So the person making the car was a very high-skilled person, making, because Ford was not the first person to make cars. A lot of people made cars before Ford. But Ford became the, the richest, most successful company in the world by de-skilling. Put people on the assembly line and have them work, do the same thing over and over again every three minutes. Unfortunately, Chris, that became the model in the world. Everybody else copied it because Ford was so, so successful. General Motors, DuPont, everybody copied Ford Motor System. And look at work today. Work is devastating. People go to work and we're looking for simplicity. That's why we can install robots so easy today because work is so deadly, so easy to replicate or easy to do. People have such infinite creative, such potential to have such great skills. Well, Canon camera did something great in Japan. I've been going to Canon maybe 25 times over the last 30, 40 years. They've been very good to me. When I first went to Canon, People were making the cameras and things together. Then they set up their assembly line. Then they set up their conveyor belt. And in the conveyor belt and the assembly line, people spent only three to four minutes doing one thing over and over and over and over again. And the funny thing is the, the assembly line and the conveyor belt always goes at the speed of the slowest worker. Well, Canon got the idea, and they got the idea from Toyota. Let's expand the role of people. Volvo did it many years ago. Canon has 29 women at the last count. They're called supermeisters. And they're able to make the whole copier with over a thousand parts. Takes them about three hours to do it. And they do it in a cell all by themselves. All of the parts that they needed are surrounded around them. They have with spiders, these people that run around bringing them all the things that they need. And they're doing it, Chris at 30% higher productivity, almost at the level of perfection, because they built in all of these pokayoke systems to prevent people making mistakes. And one woman, when she completed this copier, she signed her name and she said, you know, I just thought I made another baby. There's such pride in work when we expand people's capability. One day, Chris, I'm at Hitachi and I'm watching a man and he picks up a little disc, and he puts the disc into the machine, and the machine did something, took it three seconds for the machine to do it. The man takes the part out, puts it down on the table, takes another one and puts it into the machine. The machine does something, and then he takes it out and it puts it down. Then all of a sudden, the man goes, ah! He screams at the top of his lungs. He went crazy for a moment. Then he took a breath, took a deep breath, waited a few seconds, picked up another part, put it into the machine. The machine spent three seconds. He took it out and put it down again. 
We designed work for monkeys. Why? To be more productive. We buy, we make products for people to use, but we don't make the process of doing it real living. We make products to improve people's living. What was, what was, I'm trying to remember that, that uh, one company, you know, we make progress, we make products to improve people's living. That was their motto. But the process was made for idiots. Well, that has to change. And I think the moment in history is coming right now, Chris, we will start to do this. We will start to expand. We will start to train people. These 180 CEOs said they're committed to it. They don't understand it yet. I don't believe it at all. That's why I'm writing this new book. Maybe there are people out listening to me that could help me write this new book. Because I think from my experience of these hundreds of books in Japan, because Japanese companies are in the main socially responsible. The best company to me is Kyocera. Kyocera, K-Y-O-C-R-A, Kyocera is a ceramic company. They've been very successful. They're probably the best ceramic company in the world. All the computer uh, boards have chips. They're all ceramic. If you open up your iPhone, you'll see ceramic. The company was, the president was Kazuo Inamori. And Inamori ran Kyocera first on a philosophy, a philosophy. What is my company all about? What's my vision? What's my mission? But what's the philosophy? My philosophy is whatever we do must be good. It must be good for the world. Well, if it's good for the world, it must be good for the, my people. So he focused on people first. I want my people to be happy. He said, I don't care if they work 12 hours a day. I don't care about that. I want them to be happy. And if they're happy working 12 hours a day, that's fine. If they need less, then they'll do less. But I want my people to be happy. He started off with a philosophy of what the company is all about, that it's good for the people, it's good for the world, it's good for the environment, it's good in many, many ways, a key philosophy. Believe it or not, Chris, there are 10,000 Japanese managers, maybe some Americans too, that belong to something called Seiwajuku, S-E-I-W-A-J-Y-U-K-U, Seiwajuku. This is a study group where 10,000 people meet every month to study the philosophy of Inamori. Inamori was asked by the Japanese government to head up Japan Airlines. Japan Airlines went bankrupt. The national airline of Japan went bankrupt. They said, Inamori, come in and help. He took over JAL two years later. They made $2.3 billion. They went from bankruptcy to becoming one of the richest airlines in the world. Inamori taught a philosophy. He taught people to be happy. He taught, he, he taught companies to build skills and, if you, and, and to focus on the environment. And if you do things right, you'll make all the money that you need. If you do things right, you'll make all the money that you want in the world. This is what we have to teach to American companies. This concludes the three-part series with Norman Bodek, the godfather of lean. Norman has done numerous interviews in recent years on his journey. Many you can see on YouTube. You can also get his latest book, A Miraculous Life, An Unending Search for Freedom, for more insight into his interesting life.